Welcome to episode five of Spot the Pro. This is the series where we gamify screenwriting by pitting pages from pro writers against pages from writers who are not yet professionals to see if you can really tell great writing from that very first page. As always, two teams of industry professionals will try and spot which page is which. If their team gets the most right, they get bragging rights. But there are stakes here. If they select an amateur as a pro, they have to read that writer's first 10 pages and give them some private feedback. So there's gonna be lots of talk about the craft today and just maybe one of our up and coming writers will get a little boost out of this. I'm Nathan Graham Davis. I wrote the movie Aftermath, which will be out later this year. Today, I'm gonna to be moderating. Playing for the home team today is series regular Jason Gruich, who is a produced WGA writer with a number of sales under his belt. Joining Jason is our other series regular, Joe Marino. Joe is repped at Schemers Entertainment and has an indie movie in post as we speak. Playing for the away team is manager and producer Nick Light. Nick's a former fireman who went on to cut his teeth in the film business working at agencies like Paradigm and Gersh and ICM before founding his own company, Bright Light Content. He also manages Martin Aguilera, who was on episode two of this show, as well as our very own Jason Gruich. Joining Nick is none other than Thomas Jane. Thomas has had an incredible acting career that has spanned multiple decades and genres. He's who I think of when I think of The Mist. He's who I think of when I think of The Punisher. And his show Trapo, which he also produced and directed, just dropped its second season on Amazon. So if you haven't checked that out already, definitely do it. So Nick and Thomas, we've all been talking about this. Uh, and we are super interested to get your takes because, you know, Nick, you've got your former agency experience and then all of your experience as a manager and producer. That's a perspective that writers are always curious about. Thomas, you've been looking for scripts as a leading man for a long time. And a lead actor's perspective on how a script opens is something I'm not sure I've ever heard in all the years I've been doing this. So do you guys have any thoughts or predictions that you want to share before we get into this? Well, we're the underdogs. So we're, we're <laughs> exactly. determined to kick your butt. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I love it. The competition is always fierce in this show. I would just say that it's, uh, it's super important, you know, when it comes to uh, first pages of a, of a script that, uh, you know, you want to have something that really kind of gets the, gets the reader going. Um, you know, there are a lot of pieces of material that go through the agencies and, uh, you know, you want to start off and kind of show that you're, you know, that your pacing is going to be on point, that you're going to have you know, a first line for an actor that is really enticing, that's really going to get them excited. It makes it easier to put the project together. And, uh, and yeah, and just kind of get uh, attention from agents. Cool. Yes. Uh, you got anything you want to add to that, Thomas? Um, no, all that is true. Uh, grabbing, you know, gr look, we're all interesting thing about scripts, especially these days, you know, cause I'm, uh, an old school guy who started out when the agencies used to deliver my scripts to my house. And I got, you know, an actual script to sit down and scribble on and, and read something that I held in my hand today. You know, you're lucky if, if somebody's, you know, reading your script on your phone, uh, on their phone at, at lunch hour, you know, and then if you're really lucky, it'll be sort of after work, when they maybe have an hour, maybe before bed, that they and they have a stack of scripts and they're well, they want to flip through them. So grabbing someone's attention and there's you know a number of ways to do that, but uh, always go with Billy Wilder's quote: "Grab them by the throat and never let them go." Great right. quote. Yep. I haven't heard that reference in a long time. I kind of forgot about it completely. Uh, that's awesome. There's a specific thing that. I, I think there's a, a rule that uh, a lot of the writers I know kind of hold the heart and they have a different way of expressing it, but basically, can you write something in a way on the first page where somebody who does, who is exhausted, who could not give less than two shits about what you're doing or what you're writing or what's important to you, are you going to get that person to lean back or lean forward and go, oh, mm -hmm. this is different yep. already. This is different from something in my pile. Love it. And if if that is locked in on you, not just like, oh, I told a good story that has a beginning, middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. That's not enough anymore. Absolutely. Cool. Um, well, let's do this. Uh, so if everybody's ready and you have your pages up, um, let's jump into it. Uh, and by the way, although Joe and I technically went four for four on the last episode, 
It was not a clean four for four. Uh, we disagreed on two of them and we got lucky by deferring to the right teammate. So uh, that first ever clean four for four is still up for grabs. Uh, and so with that, <laughs> let's start with uh, A1. All right. Uh, exterior Mars day. The sun hangs in a dusty orange sky. A man in a spacesuit lies dying on the ground. He reaches out a hand, collapses. Blood pools from his body and spreads across the red Martian dirt. Then something bizarre happens. The blood starts boiling. It bubbles up and disappears into the low pressure atmosphere, leaving behind a cracked and cratered stain. Cut to black. Fade in. Exterior San Diego morning. Waves crash and foam on a beach littered with microplastics. Bland high-rise apartment buildings crowd the coast. This is the San Diego of the near future. Interior apartment kitchen, morning. A leather bifold wallet opens to reveal a police badge. Rhonda Hawthorne stares down at it, almost in a trance. Clive Hawthorne barges in. Clive, it's finally here. Rhonda quickly shuts the wallet and hides it underneath a newspaper. The headline, shuttles leaving monthly for Mars. Clive, oblivious, plops down a hardcover book and eagerly watches Rhonda's reaction. She casually sips her coffee. Rhonda looks professional. Clive, we'll send copies to Frankie and Vi along with our farewell video. The book is a photo album of their life together. Dating in college, their wedding, Rhonda getting her badge with the Boston Police Department. And that's A1. Moving on to A2. Okay, main title sequence. Before our story begins, we voyage through an artistic montage of death, hooded, cloaked, faceless, playing chess against mortal opponents throughout history. 491 AD, India. Death faces off against a pale young boy in a healer's temple surrounded by the dead and dying. 642 AD, Egypt. Death's opponent is an Egyptian soldier. The great library of Alexandria burns around them. 1157 AD, Japan, death plays against a one-armed girl in a gazebo. Raindrops dance across a lotus-covered pond. 1504 AD, Spain, death versus Queen Isabella I, a battle axe of a woman in her royal bedchamber. 1713 AD, Patagonia, death's opponent is an old woman. The sun rises over the endless plains as she surrenders. 1900 AD, Austria, Austria. death plays Willem Steinitz the world's first chess champion in a dank mental hospital. Fade out. Prelude, death and love. Fade in, the sounds of a hospital, footsteps, chatter, the beep of a heart monitor. Interior hospital room, children's wing, night. Clearly the room of a frequent flyer, cards from classmates decorate the wall, and the hospital bed is made up with faded Ninja Turtle sheets. Stephen Heim, 11, black with the long gangly limbs he might someday grow into, sits up in bed, carefully playing chess against himself around an IV drip. From the shadows, death emerges, hooded and cloaked, face completely obscured by shadow. For a moment, the boy and death stare each other down. Stefan, are you death? Are you, are you death? A regal nod. Stefan takes a deep breath. He's a brave kid. The hooded head turns to the battered chess set at Stefan's feet. And that is pair A. Uh, nice. So typically the way that we do this, Home team gets last ups, which means they go first uh, this time around. So Jason and Joe, let's hear what you have to say about the first pair. Joe, you want to start? Sure. Um, so I don't have a strong feeling for either of these. I do find myself more dramatically drawn to pay, uh, page two, but the, the there are usually I'm able to pick out more writing, you know, specific writing elements that are mm -hmm. leading me one or the other. I think that I don't feel the detail in a one very much. Uh, you know, for example, I could see that you know a man in a spacesuit lies dying on the ground. He reaches out a hand, collapses. I would love to see like that should be elongated. That should be milked. The fact that it's just so simple. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't really love that element but i do love the blood starts boiling i don't know if it's enough to completely grab me though um and I, I i i don't like then something bizarre happens that might just be me but i feel like if you just told me the blood starts boiling i know that's bizarre i i buy that already so there's mm -hmm. a i think there's slightly less 
slightly less confidence in there. At page two is is a buy-in because of course you're going against one of the great movies of all time here. You know, you're leaning into that's our understanding of Jess and the chess board. And I do like how this is leading into, you know, what would this what would this look like if we're if this is then going to end up being fully modern day, you know. Mm -hmm. But both ways, I don't see something in the clarity of writing that's leading me one way or the other. I think if I had to pick right now, it would be A2 just because I'm more in, uh, engrossed in what's happening. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I feel pretty strongly that it's A2. Um, like like you're saying in the first one, a couple of things threw me in the first one. It, you know, it's... It felt a little like Ian Shore was saying last episode, like a choice, um, you know, and then like when I got to the newspaper, this is supposed to be kind of in the near future and the newspaper kind of felt like it dated it a, a bit, um, which, you know, could be indicative of first choices uh, story wise. But like you were saying, it's, it's, it's it feels simple. It's very clear. I get what's going on. You know, there's we're leaving for Mars and we're in the near future here and we're, we're trying to focus on these, this, this couple. Um, A2 for me really pulled me in. I mean, it was it starts off. I saw Taren, you know, in Tarantino's scripts, um, he likes to start off with here's the opening credits and here's the song. Go, and he can do all that stuff, you know, and people are going to read it. But I got the same vibe here when it started with the main title sequence, because you can, I, you know, in my head when I'm looking at that. It's unfolding. You've got a really interesting take on death playing chess with the people he's taken to the afterlife um, throughout history. And then it kind of fades back into, you know, current times with this sick kid in the hospital. And it's like, oh, no, you already know what's coming because it's been set up. And the last line on that on, on A2, I thought really was a great hook. Um, and I want to see where this goes. But yeah, A2 really uh, engaged me more in one page than the first than a one did all right so home team and seven a2 seal i always get always gets credit for seven seal references nice. i love seeing that <laughs> yeah. all right uh so home team's going a2 away team nick and thomas what are your thoughts so we can agree or disagree on, on this right with the, you, you have to come right? to a consensus by the end of it um but like gotcha. yeah so that's, okay. that's the trick so all right thomas you want to go first sure um let's see uh what do we learn a1 we learn that there's um space flight going on to mars we learn that something creepy is happening on mars then we uh go down to earth we see the future <clears throat> we see that earth is polluted um we see that it's not too far into the future. We reveal there's a woman who is a police officer. Um, and what we assume is her husband comes in and he's excited. And they learn we learn that there's shuttles that are now leaving to this planet that obviously has something um, mysterious going on with it. But they're very excited to get there. We also learn that um, they've been planning this for a while because they've created a book of their life uh, that they're going to hand out to their friends and their farewell letter, which they're going to say goodbye. So this cop uh, who is happily married with, is has been planning to move to Mars, I guess... Uh, Elon Musk has finally gotten his Mars colony going. And, and we learn all that in page one. All right. That A2, what do we learn? Death is playing chess with a whole lot of people, probably everybody. And he's been doing it for centuries. And now he's in, he's, his latest uh, match is going to be with this young black kid who's clearly been sick for a long time that's it yeah mm -hmm. so, so here's so what no. I'll yeah so i mean just to, to finish my thought uh a2 is not nearly as interesting or tells me as much as a1 does a1 
uh, relies on the director to create, you know, when I read this, I'm thinking, okay, the blood starts boiling. What can I do with that? What does that mean? Where is this going? When I learn what the mystery actually is, how would I fill that out to make it exciting? Because you're absolutely right. Like that's quick on the page, but quick is what I like. Don't waste my fucking time. I get it. Something's going on. I'll fill in the blanks until now, if I get through the script and there's nothing there, then my first question, if I like the script, is going to be what the fuck's going on with the blood boiling? Okay. <laughs> so yeah. let's, go ahead, Nick. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with you there. I think that A1 for me, um, I'm just going to back up. Um, A1 for me, I think is the writer clearly has a grasp on how to get into the story, how to put the hook in, and then to move on and to and to keep the story going. Um, you know, you see the blood boiling thing, which I think definitely, you know, has everybody's the reader's interest, you know, right off right off the bat. And then, you know, it kind of moves into introducing what I assume are, you know, the main the main characters. And, you know, from there, another thing that I'll say is, uh, you know, clearly the writer has a grip on white space, using white space as a friend, um, you know, to kind of get the reader through the first page and to kind of start the process of them, uh, you know, going through a page turning experience. Oh, good point. So mm -hmm. that's what I'll say about a one, um, a two to me, I think there's a lot of information. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'll agree with you. I don't really connect with a two as much as I do with a one. And I think it's just because they're trying to explain too much too fast. Um, you know, this, this one, on the other hand, doesn't really have as much, uh, command of the white space is your friend rule. Um, and I feel like a reader could potentially get a little bit slowed down right off the jump and maybe have a slower experience of a read. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll go, I'll go with a one. Cool. All right. Um, this is fun. All right. So uh, <laughs> totally fun. I'll reveal the, the, who the pro is, first of all. Uh, so the first of all, the pro is A2. So home to, home team, you got it. Uh, oh, nice. That's Let's Anne see. Hell, followed by Erica Schreiber. Uh, she's the, actually the co-host of the Untitled Female Driven Podcast, which is a really great screenwriting podcast. Uh, but she's developed fe features for Bloomhouse, wrote a martial arts movie for XYZ. Um, she sold an original uh, to Paramount with Project X producing. Um, and uh She's uh, got things going on the TV side uh, with Don Cheadle's the, This Radical Act and uh, Regina King's Royal Ties. So she's been crushing it. Um, and I, I like it. every every page in this, I, I personally really liked. And, you know, I, I think it's really cool how she set up the world there um, with death and everything like that. And just uh, I like the whole chess motif very much. Um, so totally, I thought it was very cool. Um, A1 was Blood Planet by Jerem Scott Andrews. Um, so, uh, and I really liked that uh, for a lot of the reasons that you guys pointed out. Um, interestingly, Jason, like you pointed out the newspaper and the, the book, I'm now I'm curious and maybe he'll throw it in the comments and answer us. But I, when I read those, I thought that they indicated like something had happened in the world that caused us to be using newspapers and like hard copies mm. of books again and things like that. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Mm. Like we're getting a lot yeah, of really yeah. interesting mystery right on yeah. page one. Um, right on. So well, that's so really fast, cool. It's so fascinating how people pick up different things, you know. Yeah. Why it's so yeah. Oh, so that's really cool. Yeah. That's interesting. I'm very no. pleased to hear that uh, that a, that that A one is uh, an up and coming writer. That's yeah. That's really yeah. neat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll, um, really I'll show neat. the logline of that real quick. Um, it's uh, it, so it's Blood Planet. A former detective arrives at a remote Martian colony, only to discover a murder has just taken place there. As the investigation unfolds. She uncovers a disturbing connections between her tangled past and the future of life on Mars. Um, nice. So Jared's so, a writer. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Cool. No. So one thing I often do when I have three or four scripts in my yep. pile that I need to read, I'll read the first page of each one. And, oh, really? and if these two, if these two were on my pile, I would start reading one before I start reading two. So that's really because, yeah. interesting. You know, take Nick's point. Like, it just looks like a lot of work. You know, to read this A2, and he and they, we took a page, and yeah, I, I get it. It's the it's the title sequence, but it didn't it didn't um, didn't grab me. 
Yeah, I mean, I you think know, now, now I, I would can, I wouldn't throw it across the room. I would definitely get to it. <laughs> you know, I could I could tell, OK, where is this going? You know, so and and so the first page is not doesn't necessarily have to, you know, not knock you out out of the uh, out of the park right away. I, I generally give a script 10 pages, you know, if yeah. it, yep. when, when and after 10, you can generally figure out whether or not this is something you want to spend your time reading. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I really love yeah. how uh, Thomas, I really love how you basically were like, look, I want to just look at how many things am I learning? And I I'm, those cool I, yeah. I've never, I've yeah. never thought of a first page that way with be genuinely just letting yourself being impressed and immersed in the amount of information you're genuinely getting. Uh, which can work against you also i mean there's lots of different ways to skin the cat as as everybody knows you know yeah. it's essentially what what is what grabs you uh and a lot of that's uh you know personal i mean uh yeah the, the, between the, these are both difficult to tell like uh, if uh, which one is the pro so that was that was a good that's choice. what we try and do yeah. here it, it would be less fun <laughs> if it wasn't challenging so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's cool i i'm really uh, that's a great discussion already um just because we'd like to give background especially on the the amateur writers who are gutsy enough to throw their pages up here um jerem's a writer from san diego he writes high high concept uh features in the horror and thriller genres his script, The Earth Grinder, was selected as a semifinalist in this year's script pipeline, uh, which means it was like one of 15 out of a few thousand. So super wow. cool. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think he's a guy who's on his way. So great. Wow. Um, Very cool. Let's jump sure. into uh, the second pair, B. All right. Uh, B1, Fade In. The unrelenting wail of a baby crying. Camera moves through a rundown apartment littered with late 1980s cultural detritus. Three's company plays on the TV in the dirty department, liquor bottles, junk food wrappers, a scene that makes you embarrassed to be an American. The crying doesn't let up. <laughs> Camera tracks low into the bathroom. An infant sits on the floor bawling. The bathtub tap is on. A woman's arm bobs over the edge of the tub. The overflowing water is crimson with blood. Keech, off screen. Hey, hey, it's all over. Keech sits in the chair. He's sleek, handsome, and hard, an emotional amputee. In an odd, shiny, metallic undershirt, sideburns long and angled, he is fashionable, but not a fashion we recognize of the time. Camera circles. Keech to reveal an infant on the floor in front of him. The infant stops crying. His eyes are dark and piercing, identical to Keech's. He and the infant regard each other. Keech, shh, it's going to be okay now. The man, Keech, smiles, a hollow, deathly rictus meant to be a reassuring. The baby reassumes, cr crying hysterically as Keech wipes blood from a strange metal instrument, a miniature handheld umbrella ringed with clamps. In the center, a series of scissors offset to cut on every conceivable angle, a handle grip with pulley controls. Keech puts the instrument in a worn leather case like a doctor's surgical tool pouch. More pieces of futuristic equipment, something like a sleek carpenter's plane, razor sharp blade set lengthwise in its underside, like row upon row of shark's teeth, a black length of tubing, like an arthroscope. On one end, a small pulsing labor to laser tube. At the other, a mishmash of arcs and curves resembling a cooking whisk or egg beater. Keech replaces the last tool in the case, dabs at one last streak of blood. Keech reassures the baby, who continues to cry inconsolably. Keech. No one's going to hurt you ever. All right, moving on to B2. Exterior, park, day. A Chicago American Giants pennant flaps in the wind. Laughter, a hazy blur of kids playing tag. A young black girl, seven, peers away in the distance toward, toward a public restroom partially covered in faded WPA posters. The glimmer of a large figure disappears behind the restroom. The girl wanders away from the kids. The laughter rises. A dark rain poncho watches from afar, trails her. The face inside is Dr. Isaiah, 50, a woman bearing a strong resemblance, thin locks brushing across her face as she paces forward. Isaiah sees the girl enter the bathroom, hears, shoe squeaks, struggle, muffled screams. Dr. Isaiah kicks in the door. Interior, park bathroom, continuous. A gruff and feral man holds the girl, dingy hand over her mouth, tears stream down her face, her hands tug at an escape to no avail. Dr. Isaiah draws a scythe. Gruff man snarls, reveals a set of deadly claws. Dr. Isaiah slices and amputates this mouth covering hand. The girl's voice is free. From overhead outside, a hypersonic scream. Smash to location unknown, continuous. 
Super 2009, darkness and a faint blue light. Dr. Isaiah startles alert, gasping, water rolling off her head and face. And that is pair B. All right. So uh, Nick and Thomas, you're up first this time. That is a tough one. Um, <laughs> hmm. Thomas, what do you think? I responded to the first one more than I responded to the second one. The first one got my attention in the, the mystery uh, of um, of who this guy Keech is, what the hell he's doing with these odd, you know, metallic undershirt. I love the way he's described uh, as an emotional amputee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, I was like, OK, that's, that's great. That catches Clever. that catches yeah. me, and that, that when a writer can, you know, I I had the um, pleasure of reading a bunch of Walter Hill scripts. Me and Walter were going to do a couple of different projects together, and and it never ended up happening. It's one of the great disappointments of my life. Um, but Walter would send me stuff that he hadn't got made. Uh, he sent me some early stuff, some some stuff that he'd recently written. This is. 20 years ago. This is after The Punisher. And uh, Walter's scripts are so unique in their economy. They're, they really, if you, any, uh, all writers out there, I highly recommend, if you haven't read Walter Hill, read him. He's able to convey so much with so little. Emotional amputee r- reminded me of that. You know, that would have been the line, his description of that character. Mm-hmm. And, and, and leave you to figure out the rest, and, which I personally love. Um, because it gets your imagination going and and it respects the uh, the writer's time. Um, this, but this is, you know, this has some some this is mostly description, which is fine. Um, in fact, you know, uh, contrary to popular belief, actors aren't looking for uh, they aren't counting their line, at least the good actors are not counting their lines. They're not, ma- you know, making sure they're introduced first in the script. Uh, they, they want they want to be sucked in uh, just like any other audience member. And that and that that one gets my imagination going. And the second one, I got a little bit confused. I mean, I guess there's there's a figure. There's a there's a girl in a park. Um, so for some. Oh, and I love that you pronounced is the right way what's that i always say i always say skive yeah (laughs) or skiff well i you know there's a Uh, a, a couple side stories in here we had the one in the in a as well with death so there you go just i've got lots of practice (laughs) (laughs) yeah and it's a good couple of uh you know they're both they both have similar it's a good pairing because they both have similarities um but uh I have to, I would go with A because that's the one that I would want to read first. Yeah, I think that I am probably going to agree with you there. I think that A, and of course, you know, it's really interesting to hear all the different perspectives and how everybody's kind of like looking at the first yeah. page from, you know, in kind of like for different reasons. You know, my mind immediately is going to, um, you know, what's this, what's the pacing that's going to be like? What's the introduction of the character like? How am I going to use that to try and package an actor in it? How am I going to use that to try and get as many reads as possible? Um, just by kind of, you know, judging what's a page turning experience um, up front. You know, B1, I think, is very well written. Um, there's a lot to like there, um, you know, both in the description and then also in the in the dialogue. I also love first lines that kind of start off in the action, you know, where it's like, hey, it's all, it's all over. Um, it kind of like makes you feel like you're joining in the middle of something. It feels a little bit more natural um, mm-hmm. of, of a beginning. So I think that this writer clearly knows what they're doing. Um, mm-hmm. B2, I think there are, there, are, there are reasons to like B2 as well. Um, but I would feel, I would say that B2 feels a little bit less organized than B1 does. Um, however, B2 has perks to it also. Like, you know, I love writers that, you know, will write one or two lines of prose and then move on and just keep the, keep it going, keep the experience going, as opposed to B1, where it's like, you know, four or five lines of prose in each, mm. in each paragraph. Um, Mm. that can be that can be telling sometimes too 
but I, I think that I'm going to go with B1. I think I'm going to jo- yeah, join you and go with B1. Cool. All right. All right. Yeah. Away teams going B1. What about you guys? Um, I can start. Um, I I uh, agree with this. I agree with I agree with the away team because I think that it it feels more confident to me. I I I, I guess I look for two things in particular. I'm looking for is there is there genuine confidence of the of what you're trying to convey? And I feel like the level of confidence that's there on like page one being I'm going to describe two incredibly difficult to explain instruments. And and if you don't see it, you don't see it. That this is a big risk to mm. take this early on. Like I, I'm still kind of like, man, yeah, I, I don't think I would do this. Where I'm like, I'm gonna live or die based on if on you understanding this death umbrella. That's a and 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 I feel like there's confidence there. And then the emotion. Uh, so then the second thing for me would be uh, emotional context. Do I have enough here to believe that this is going to in some way emotionally get me? And I just already feel that um, this guy looking over this child after he's just killed what I assume to be a, a parent and the the attitude that he has towards the child is already leaning towards an emotional mystery that I like. Um, whereas I, I feel a little more confused and disjointed by page two. I, I get that I'm supposed to lock in on the seven-year-old, but I don't understand it quite enough to, to have that happen for me. So I'm going B1 as well. Yep, I agree. I think it's B1. Um, B1, the sheer, the sheer storytelling, um, you know, just really, it really grabs you. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's real blocky with the text, but it's like Joe was saying, like, I felt something on this page, especially at the end when he, the irony there, when, when Keach turns to the, the kid, like, do you trust him? You know, is he there? I want to know what happened. Like, and you're, you're, you're jumping right to the middle of this. Um, and it's very deliberate and intentional with all of the detail that's in there. And then when you break it down further, writers who put in like camera moves through a rundown and camera tracks low and camera circles, like to me, that's, and also the description is fantastic after that. But when I see stuff like that, when I see it done well, like it is on this page, it, it, to me, that's vision. And it looks like a director's writing this to direct each shot that he sees clearly in his mind. Mm. Um, and which transcribed and translated perfectly to the page for me personally. B2, I agree. Um, didn't I didn't feel like anything yet, but it, it felt like it was the, the shots in my mind were a little more disjointed. Uh, and there was a lot maybe a, a mild lack of uh, <clears throat> interconnectivity between, I guess, what the writer's intending you to visualize. Um, but, but yes, I mean, the economy, the white space is there in page two. There's stuff to love about it, um, you know. Uh, but yeah, for those reasons, I, th- I think it's B1 for this one. Actually, cool. I'd, like to jump, I'd like to jump on that for just half a second. Yep. I think yeah. the, the issue for me with page two very specifically is when things happened, they felt random. Like the idea yeah. of Dr. Isaiah, no uh, Dr. I, yeah, Dr. Isaiah pulls out a scythe. When that happens, I'm like, where, where did that come from? Yeah, my first reaction is, it, how cool is that, that somebody's pulling out a scythe? It's like, where the hell was it before before I'm yeah. seeing it now? And I, I, context is critical for something like that. Like if I knew he was hiding something clearly, you know, there's just other elements that, and I understand like I'm, I'm assuming with a scythe, you're dealing with death and it is just going to come out of magically nowhere, but I shouldn't yeah. be stopping and being like, how is that possible? And I think and I had the, to do that too many times. Sure. Yeah, and I think, and another little thing that I, I just noticed reading it was like at the very end of the first uh, scene description, exterior part day, where Isaiah sees the girl enter the bathroom, hears, and then shoe squeaks, struggle, muffled screams. I think, to me, that feels like a writer who who is, I get the intention, but is getting too caught up in, I need white space, instead of leaning in a little bit more to like, kind of really make those things pop like you know here's gets its own line which it's fine it, it makes the read fast and vertical which is great but do you really need you know here's on its own line there and it's just again that's a nitpicky thing that's not a deal breaker mm. i mean at all mm. you know the page flows and mm. uh but yeah like little things like that's what makes me think b1 cool. anytime i'm anytime i'm interested in in something that is not white space versus something that is i i feel like okay there's a reason you know there's something yeah. really yeah, special yeah. going on when somebody goes against the you know the rule mm. of make this easy to read and we still pick that and we're still gravitating towards that because mm. going to what going to what thomas said for the last one it's like 
this looks like a lot of work when you're still reading, even though you know it's a lot of work. Yes. That's yeah. that special sauce. That's when you know you have something special. Like I think everybody prefers. I know I do. I prefer white space. Nice, quick, fast read. I can read it fast. Especially yeah. when you first open a script, right? And you just see it. Ah, oh, white space. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it just pulls you in. Let me point out that the, the dichotomy uh, between this innocent baby and this man with a hollow, deathly rictus uh, is 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 um, instinctually captivating, right? That, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That is cool. A great point. Well, you are all right. Uh, the, pro, the pro page is B1. Um, that was Ticking Clock by John Terman. Uh, John, oh, nice. yeah, John wanted to share this page because he wrote it before he was a professional. Uh, this script mm. helped him get there. It got him studio mm. work uh, after various options and rewrites. It eventually got made as a modest budget indie starring Cuba Gooding Jr. titled Ticking Clock. It's on streaming. It's different now. But that scene, the opening scene has really remained mostly unchanged and is still mm. there. Um, so mm. John went on to have a really cool career. Uh, his credits include uh, Ang Lee's Hulk. Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer, projects for nearly every studio, TV work, including franchises like The Crow, The Saint, Ben 10, and uh, the recent reboot of MacGyver on CBS. Um, so, uh, and uh, he was something of a, a mentor to me. So it was fun to share one of his pages here. That's yeah. neat. That was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, page hey, well two, done. B2 was Origin by Reggie Johnson. Uh, the logline for that, facing a terminal illness, a Silicon Valley economist must travel through the lives of her deceased ancestors to find the source of a generational curse. Reggie's a USC graduate from LA who creates stories for the three brains in his words, the mind, the heart, and the gut. Um, and that's B. Uh, that's let's move on to C. Fade in on white sunlight penetrating a dense canopy of leaves. Exterior of woods, day. Shots of buzzing Mississippi backwoods until we find Bailey Heller, 20s, crouched in hunter's camouflage, Perched in a tree stand, rifle in hand, scope attached, pale, doleful eyes locked in a thousand yard stare. He starts at the sound of machine gun fire. Far off, ghostly, staccato bursts. Rat a tat tat. Grips his rifle, scans for a target. No wait, it's a woodpecker. Pecking at a tree. Rat a tat tat. Bailey sighs, rubs his eyes. Nearby in another tree stand. Wayne Heller, 30s, perpetual scowl. Weeks growth of beard, dirt under his nails, at home in the wild. Compound bow in hand, Wayne surveys with predatory eyes, spots a large buck moving softly through the brush. He peers over at Bailey, issues an avian whistle. Bailey's POV, Wayne holds a hand to his head, fingers spread like antlers. Bailey scans, makes out the buck in the foliage, puts the rifle to his shoulder, lines it up in his sights. Exhales a half breath, holds. Finger caresses the trigger. A fly lands on his cheek. He doesn't flinch, but he wavers. The buck's big brown eyes, the peaceful air, he can't do it. Breathing hard, eyes watering, he backs off the trigger. Wayne grits his teeth, sneers as he watches Bailey falter. He lines the buck up in his own sights, pulls back on the bow, muscles tensing, jaw set, eyes narrow. And that's C1. C2. Exterior farm day. Corn. An ocean of green corn stalks roll over endless prairie. A man-made oasis tucked inside a shelter belt of cottonwoods. Old red barn with chipping paint, metal machine shed, a farmhouse with a sagging front porch. Patrick, 40s, marches out with shotgun in hand, face awash in tears. A hardened farmer admitting defeat for the first time. Muffled screams briefly escape from somewhere inside before the door slaps shut. Silence returns. Boards creak as he steps across the porch, down the steps. Operator, voiceover, 911, what is your emergency? Patrick, voiceover, I can't, I can't do this again. He crosses the yard, disappears behind the machine shed. Operator, voiceover, sir, what is your emergency? Heavy breathing between sobs. Patrick, voiceover, tell Brianna, daddy, sorry. A moment of hesitation. Clouds drift overhead. Golden corn tassels catch the slight breeze. A shotgun blast. Crows take to the sky as the blast reverberation turns into interior bedroom night, the ring of a cell phone on a nightstand. And that's C. All right, home team, Jason and Joe, you're up. Hmm. This is like the battle of the white space, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my gut tells me it's C2. 
um, there was a couple of things in C1 that I just bumped on um, where I didn't bump at all in C2, um, which was, I thought it was interesting. One has a bow and one has a gun. The thing I bumped on is Bailey's in his 20s. And it, and I think it was the woodpecker. It's like, it was an interesting choice to kind of, it felt like a gotcha moment. Like the writer's trying to maybe, maybe visualize the backstory and Bailey Heller. But then I was like, she, that person's in their 20s maybe they don't have this ptsd you know like she, she hears the woodpecker and she's triggered into remembering something like that's where my mind went when i read that um and then she can't pull the trigger so wayne has to make the kill um but i, I didn't get a good sense of like why thematically like kind of what was going on yes they're hunting i get all of that that's that's clear but those are the things I bumped on on that page. C2 was very uh, minimalistic in its execution, which is starts with a suicide. But instead of so, sh showing the guy walking with a gun on the phone, I thought there was an interesting take where you're focused on the setting and you're hearing like, what's happening. And then, you know, in any good first scene, it's going to end with a blast or, you know, it's that last shot, the shotgun blast is going to jar you and maybe make you lean in a little bit more. I think I just connected with the second one a little bit more. So that would be my gut instinct, but that was tough. Okay. Joe. Um, so I think that I, I enjoy the writing more in c1 but i like what's happening more in c2 i c2 feels mm. more like a, a a movie startup to me i like the cinematic perspective of it because there was a way that this could have been just far simpler and you know you're just as you said just watching a guy on the phone with a gun in his hand going up mm. gun, you know but th you know that there this is trying to do things in a i i feel like a uh just a slightly different way trying to to grab us i really like the idea of the first you know this first shot of some uh like a hardened farmer admitting defeat for the first time that was great that was the line i mm -hmm. enjoyed um and then the um the transition was cool at the end with the idea of uh you know the turning into the ring mm -hmm. uh, on but for me the the first one i i think i want to know more about the first two characters because yeah the idea of somebody having a choosing to hunt with a crossbow versus somebody or a, a compound bow and a rifle you know in the idea of I, I i did bump as well on i don't know if i could buy genuinely thinking a woodpecker is a machine gun i think i think that's a big buy-in that i i'm personally yeah. just like i don't know if i and I, it sucks because like yeah, because there could be, as you said, oh, it could be PTSD. There's a billion reasons that could happen, but I'm stopping being like, oh, I don't buy that. And that always sucks when you're taking a risk and you're hoping that the risk you're taking isn't just an obvious, you know, an automatic, oh, no, I don't buy that. I'm done from the yeah. reader. Yeah. Um, and, and it might be. So. And, you know, I, distant, distant gunfire does sound like a woodpecker. And, and that's a fine way to, do, you know, kind of describe it but, I, but to me like i have a woodpecker the image of a woodpecker in my head now and it kind of like bumps i'm like okay wait let me get back to where i was they're hunting and then you know like then there was a, like one part at the very bottom where a, i like how they build suspense here you know exhales half a breath holds finger caresses the trigger like that's good tension building a fly lands on his cheek but he doesn't flinch and then but he wavers so that then i'm like he doesn't flinch but he wavers kind of was contradictory to me um, i think it's, I, I, it's I, I, I think I'm going to have to lean into uh, Thomas' thing of, you know, get to the point. It is, it, as much as I like the writing, it's not getting yeah, to the point yeah. fast enough. Yeah. So, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to you on this. I think there's enough reason. I, I do still really like the writing, but yeah, yeah I defer to you. Um, I maybe want to keep going and reading, but uh, yeah, my bet says C2 for this one. I'll say C2. All right. cool. I'll, I'll go with it. C2 for the home team. All right, uh, away team. What do you guys think? Um, I'll I'll lead off here uh, this time. Um, it's a close one. Um, it's definitely a close one. I think that both uh, pages do a good job at building suspense, but kind of in different ways. Um, you know, this first page reminds me a lot of the opening of American Sniper. Mm -hmm. um, because it opens the same kind of way uh, with uh, somebody teaching somebody to, to hunt um then it kind of feels like 
Like there's, you know, I think that we're, we're just missing, you know, what the significance of this moment is probably in the next scene, um, mm -hmm. which probably happens on page two. But, you know, that being said, it kind of grabs me and it pushes me forward. It makes me want to read the next page. Um, you know, there may be a lot being said on, you know, on the first page as opposed to the second. You know, I, I think that I'm gravitating towards C2 also, just because this page, this opening page, it feels so clean um, in its execution. And just clearly there's a plan. The writer knows how to hook the audience and how to get them going. And there's not much else there. Um, you know, and it kind of probably will really, you know, create a really fast paced kind of read, um, you know, and I forget who had mentioned it, Jason, you may have mentioned it just how, um, you know, that you see a lot going on in the background and in the scenery, but there's like a lot of voiceover. Um, and I think that that's all very clever and it's a, it's a cool way to kind of build suspense. Um, so this writer definitely has the command of, uh, of the craft. Um, I'm going to vote. I'm going to have to vote C, uh, C2. Thomas, what do you think? Well, I can't help but judge both pages by my own personal interest in the story, you know, and then, and then I have to remind myself that this, this isn't necessarily about that. Uh, in fact, it's not about that. This is about who is the pro and, 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 and who's the amateur. Um, but going and and they're both scenes that I've seen before. Okay. So I've seen the farmer. I mean, I've seen this scene. I've seen the farmer shoot himself in his cornfield. Um, and I've seen the uh the guy who can't shoot the deer because he obviously has uh something going on. It's 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 alluded to with the woodpecker, I agree. Is that the best all alliteration, uh, you know, but it does get the job and we, I can't judge that until I actually know what's happening with these, these two guys, which we don't, what we do know is that something, something's going on. We've got, um, a dichotomy of opposites. You know, we have a hardened grizzly guy with a bow. And, you know, if you're a bow hunter, that means you're willing to get close. A, it's a lot harder to shoot a buck with a bow. And B, it's bloodier. It, it's it's more primal. And and then, you know, the guy with the rifle is... is Now, what one thing that bugged me is I know that there's bow hunting season and there's also rifle hunting season, but I right. don't... Yeah. And I'm, but I'm not a deer hunter, so I don't know if those overlap. So there's a bow and maybe there is, I don't know. And, and that's not a deal breaker. You know, it's a movie. I get it. Um, and there's, you know, and depending on the story, we could, you know, that's either a problem or, or it's not, um, you know, the machine, the machine gun thing. Okay. So what I am told on the, on the, this first page is that there's two characters. They're very different in a lot of ways. And that, and that this, opening scene is is um meaningful to this bailey character you know i got when the fly landed on the cheek i just got the nature you know that he's in nature that that the uh you know um the eden like uh feeling that that you get when you're sort of at one with nature is different from the feeling you get when you're out there trying to kill something so that that di dichotomy was interesting to me um, and in the second one, I, uh, like I said, um, have seen this. It, it's obviously uh, well executed. Uh, there's a number of different ways to, to sort of lay out the story of an, an old farmer who's had enough and he shoots himself in his cornfield. Um, so it, they're both pro professionally done, I, I got to say. So just in the name of, of team spirit, I'll, I'll agree with Nick. Um, even though it, by myself, I, I, I would say that, you know, I'd pick up uh, C1 before I'd pick up C2. All right. So, but final answer, you're going C2. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going right. to go with, cool. I'm going to go with our All team. Right. Sounds good. 
Uh, so in this case, C1 is actually the pro. Um, oh, damn. Wow. So damn. Okay. C1 <laughs> is Mechanicsville uh, by Jason and Chris Thornton. Uh, who, uh, <laughs> uh, Jason and Chris, I, I, I know Jason, you know Jason. Um, I don't know. Yeah, if you those do, guys uh, are really talented. But uh, they're, yeah, they're wonderful writers. Mechanicsville was the script that broke them in, earning them representation from WME and their manager, Sidney Sherman. Uh, at one point, J.K. Simmons was attached to this script. They got their guild cards when Zach Efron hired them to write a feature. They've done a number of sales and assignments since then. Um, and uh, growing tired waiting to get something to produce, they actually took fate into their own hands, made their own micro-budget feature, uh, which is the shocking micro-budget horror Cactus Jack, released in 2021, produced by yours truly. Um, so, uh, but a couple of great writers. Um, and, uh, I thought it was fun to pair with this script just because, uh, there were some similarities in the way that they approached things, a lot of efficiency in the settings. Um, yeah. and I thought it was a cool pairing. Um, but the, but C2 is germination by Leah Simmons. Um, and, uh, the, uh, log line for that okay. is in the wake of a All family right. tragedy, a fiercely independent woman reluctantly assumes guardianship of her pregnant teenage niece. But as the details of her sister's grisly death come to light, she discovers that the thing growing inside her niece is not only alien, but infectious. So oh, uh, wow. Leah is a genre writer based out of South Dakota who wrote and co-produced her first feature in 2021, uh, a roller derby thriller called Valentine Crush. Uh, in addition to features and pilots, she also pens podcasts, released her first novel this month. Uh, and when she's not writing or roller skating, she enjoys mushroom hunting with her six-year-old son. Um, Very cool. Wow. Yeah, Leah's so, awesome. So, yeah. And great writer. Wow. Um, so wow. Yeah, you can tell. Okay. Yeah. Um. Cool. Well, let's do let's do the last pair. D. So teaser interior walk in freezer night. Stevie, thirty five, sits huddled and shivering in a corner of a dim meat filled walk in freezer. She wears Chef Blacks, her name stitched in white over the breast pocket. She pulls hard on the cigarette wedge between her teeth. Her breath plumes. She contemplates something be behind a thousand yard stare. Rising from her huddle, we now see the object of her contemplation, a wheeled stainless steel food prep table. Atop it, a lumpy something lies inert under white plastic. Gingerly, smoke still clenched in her teeth, Stevie uses one pinky finger to lift the sheeting. It's dark, but the naked brown-skinned flank of a woman is dimly visible. Abstract floral tattoos scroll up over the ribs, down towards the thigh. Stevie's eyes follow them up the torso, lifting the plastic to show their progress up between the breasts toward the neck. They cut off abruptly just where the woman's head has been neatly severed with a near surgical, near surgical precision. Stevie bites back a scream, quickly drops the plastic. The door of the freezer opens, the light is blinding. She can only see the young man's silhouette. She gets up, throws the cigarette aside as she prepares to make a break for it. She gets a few paces before he raises a gun. No, it's a mobile phone. Flash on, recording her and the body. Stevie shields her front and the body. Stevie shields her face from the light. Stevie, this isn't necessary. Let me talk to him. Over the glare of the flash, we catch. We just catch a glint of the young man's smile. He holds up a well manicured hand and an and an okay sign. Young man, bellissima. All right, uh, D two. Chiron, based on a true story. Over black, we hear a seductive, confident voice. Honey, voiceover, tell me what you see. As David Bowie's iconic song, Fame, kicks in, we cut to exterior New York City day. The one and only, establishing shots of the greatest hits, skyscrapers, Central Park, the Brooklyn Bridge. Honey, voiceover, you see a city of wealth and possibility. Exterior, New York City street day. We track a stunning redhead, 20s, dressed in the latest fall fashion, walking down the street. Men gawking as she passes. Honey, voiceover. And the girl who has it all. Exterior, Park Avenue Armory Day. Chic men and women glide past velvet ropes. Paparazzi pepper the street. This glamorous mayhem is New York Fashion Week. A redhead enters a side door labeled talent. Honey, voiceover. You see an industry of glamour. Interior, Park Avenue Armory, Mark Jacobs Runway Show Day. Runway models are spit out like bullets, a redhead sliding down the catwalk, selling the hell out of what she's wearing. Honey, voiceover, and the gorgeous creatures who inhabit it. Exterior, Le Bon, rooftop nightclub, night. An exclusive after party, a redhead is having the time of her life. We freeze on her toothpaste commercial worthy smile as she cheers with a full glass of Dom Perignon. All right, that's the final pair. 
All right. Away team, uh, you're up first. Hmm. Uh, do you want to lead well, off? <clears throat> well, they're both well done. Um, again, like personally, I'd rather read uh, D1 before I read D2, but, you know, that's just me. D2 actually has a... Um, I've read uh, plenty of scripts like this, and you know that that that's both uh, a plus and and a minus. Um, it's certainly well put together. Um, it's uh, it, it does what it does, and it and it, and it doesn't do anything else. It does it well. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily interested, but uh, D D one. I mean, right off the bat, but of course, we don't know what the hell is going to happen on page two, you know, Maybe, you know the building might blow up. We don't know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and D, D1, um, you know, it's it's a big ask. Now, I like movies that start like this. I like movies that start without dialogue. I do think that it's um, to the point. I don't see any real cuts that i could make that stand out i because i don't know if the description of the tattoos are going to play i assume that they are since he spends time um the, the writer spends time describing them um and now so i can't see anything wrong with with d with d1 uh you know um and it's uh kind of grabs me you know but again this is just personal d d2 is is a perfectly well put together i mean my first instinct would be that d2 is probably the pro um just because it just seems like somebody paid them to write it <laughs> uh, but i like i like d1 better that's tough what do you think nick so i'm gonna go with uh all right so D1, I think the writer does a really good job with building tension, you know, with starting with starting us off and kind of slowly revealing information as the camera does its its initial move, what, what it seems like its initial move. Um, you know, and I guess I think my only concern. Oh. Oh, we just lost Nick. Nick. Oh, his his greatest his greatest concern is yeah that was I. really <laughs> concerning. <laughs> yeah, I would. Uh, I, awesome. I, I, I'm just gonna go. To, we'll see what Nick says when he comes back. But my, you know, I would just go with which script I would want to read, and I'd, I I want to know what's happening in D one and D two. I've read before. Now, whether you know, and that's also a a um a danger of being a professional because oftentimes you'll get an assignment and people are looking for you know not every script is you know the 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 flowering of your inner uh fears and desires you know it's 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 sometimes it's a job and this feels like a job it feels like a professional job uh d2 but but it's also a scene that i have seen so many fucking times before that if you're really going to pay me to write something, okay, and this is the scene that I, this is how I open the show. I'm not, I'm not going to hire you again, okay. So I'm going to go with D1. Oh, there's um, Nick. There's Nick. Do you want to let him jump in now, or do you want? Yeah, to... yeah. No, get him in. Right. No, make him wait. Make him wait. Right, right, right. <laughs> Put him in the waiting room. So he's, he's some good stuff. So Nick, our la the last thing that we heard from you was my biggest concern is <laughs> and then you were out. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, um so uh Thomas finished up saying that you know he split um felt like uh D2 felt like a professional job, but D1 is the one that he wanted to read more. So he's kind of leaning toward that. Does that sound right, Thomas? Yeah, absolutely. Right, yeah. Cool. I was, yeah, go ahead, Nick. So basically, sorry about that. My computer just <laughs> randomly out of nowhere. Um, so, okay. So what I'll say is, you know, I just, I wonder if on D1, if you get a little bit too bogged down in information, 
you know, for a first page. Um, you know, there isn't really that much to the first line of dialogue either. Um, you know, it kind of makes you feel like you're you're kind of like jumping into the middle of something. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I would say that D2, on the other hand, like you said, it feels like a professional wrote this this page. It takes uh, advantage of voiceover. It feels very much like an intro, the intro scene, um, maybe to some type of, uh, you know, genre film, you know, within the world of the fashion industry or something like that, um, mm -hmm. like a neon demon or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's a there's a very even balance of prose to dialogue. And there's a like a suspenseful kind of setup in the information that's being delivered. So both both pages do a really good job at at delivering information in a very suspenseful way. It's it's a very tough call, but I would probably lean towards D2. Right. So let me tell you what was the tiebreaker for me, because you because you had disappeared. Um, the uh, if, if I was hiring. A prof I've seen this scene. I, I've read this very scene a number of times. Okay. And if I was to hire somebody to write whatever this true story is, and again, you know, we can't, we cannot judge uh, the, the, but this is only based on page one, <laughs> but, but only based on page one, which is the opening of the movie. Okay. Now, one thing that I like that I always pay attention to when uh a movie opens and that and is what is the first shot you know and that's that's the director that's all the director that does not have to be on the page but mm -hmm. what is the first shot and what what are they telling a, a really strong movie i find that most really strong movies the first shot tells me something has information in it that is good that tells me what kind of journey or what the subtext is going to be um uh, you know, like the opening shot of Hereditary is a doll's house. That tells me a lot, you yeah, know, you're right. once, once you've seen the, the movie, right? So I would not, I would be underwhelmed as a producer to open up the the show on a, on a scene that I've seen a hundred times before. Now, that might be the point uh, of this script. I don't know, but just that as a person, um, professionally you know that's why i would I, and and you're right like <laughs> d2 feels like the professional job whereas d d1 feels like it might be a little riskier yeah in its description i do like uh, i don't need dialogue you know uh, some uh, i i also don't see lines that i would necessarily cut there's no extra everything described here on this for, in other words a page like this does not scare me at all. A page like this does not scare me. It de it's, it all depends on what is being, what the story is and what is being like, don't be afraid to have one page of uh, action blocks like this is. Um, so that's why I would go with D1 just because I feel like it's, it's riskier. And you know what, you may, you may actually be right. And kind of, you made a really good point about, um, you know, the opening image of the movie and kind of how we're focusing on the tattoos. And I think that there's a very strong possibility that this script somehow ends, you know, with a tattoo or this or, or the tattoo has some type of significance. Um, right. So I'll, I'll go with you with uh, with D1. Um, right. my, uh, my initial. Right. Pick. Um, all right, guys. Uh, so home team, you're up. What okay. do you got? Um, so for me, D1 is my favorite page of the, the this session. Um, I, I I feel that I've just been punched in the face with the cinematic perspective of it. I love everything about, even though like I get that the, the dialogue might be a little like, you know, just simple, you know, let me talk to him and, you know, believe him out. Like I get all that, but I, just the, the visual language of it, the idea of, go, you know, going up to this lump you know, uh, how what was it? The, the a lumpy something lies inert uh, under the white mm -hmm. plastic. The way you're re slowly revealing uh, this tattoo up until the head, like I, I I think that it's just such a smart way of doing it. And I don't think most writers would have done it this way. I think that this feels like the more polished 
uh, execution of how to write this type of scene. Whereas I, I think I want to agree with the away team on, yes, the, the, the B, D2 is professional. It does feel professionally written, but it's not doing anything, at least not the second, that feels like it's something I haven't seen uh, before. Well, what's, what's the choice that's making the, the bigger executional risks? Um, now, the thing I like a lot is like the idea of, you know, a run, a runway model spit out like bullets and the idea of, you know, you see an industry of glamour and the gorgeous creatures who inhabit it. Those are great little beats right there, but it, I don't think it's enough to make me go, I want to turn the page because I feel like I've seen it enough that, that, that it's just, you know, I would have to have one more random detail in there to be like, well, what's that in this world? Um, whereas I feel like I'm getting that by the spoonful in D1. So I, a hundred percent, a thousand percent, I would like to go D1. <laughs> I, I have to agree. D1, D1 is probably my favorite page of the whole, of the whole bunch. Hmm. Um, hmm. Personal favorite, like, so the one thing I wanted to point out about D1 for me is it takes you kind of on this emotional roller coaster in the way that they reveal information they want you to know. So like it starts off, there's, you know, it's a gr the first block is someone smoking a cigarette in a freezer. To me, that's like, what? That's okay. Is it a chef? Is she on break? Uh, is it a period piece? Right. Yes. <laughs> right. And then it's, you know, we're looking at what's under the sheet. And then it's now the flank of a woman. Is she in a morgue? And then it's like, so you, it goes from like this cooking show in my head to this, you know, this troubled chef to now we see there's a body in there. Is she in a morgue? And then there's more information that's revealed where now she's like Hannibal Lecter's got her, you know, like what's going on here? Anyway, it, it really pulled me in on an emotional level. And I agree. I love what Thomas said about D2. It, that does look like a professional job. I, I would have never thought to have articulated that way, but um, and it is written almost to perfection. Um, so you know, B one's my favorite page, and I think it is risky with and it's confidence. It's very confident in what they want you to see. Um, so I'm going to go with D one because I, I get a really good sense at the bottom of that page. That I want to know everything else that happens. Yep, in D one. You know? That's a it's a movie. It's a movie. Yeah, it feels yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Like B2 could be like pretty one or Devil Works Prada. I get what y'all are saying. Like I've seen that scene too. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's it's mm -hmm. well constructed and put together. Mm -hmm. Um I love those movies. It's just oh man, I just I really love D1. All right. Mm -hmm. So uh the consensus for everybody is D1, is that correct? It it could yeah. be either one, yeah. but yes, I think yeah. I'm gonna go with D1. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh D2 is the pro. Uh, D two is a queen. Me to lose this one. That, I mean, yeah. I, I I'll get to that in just a second. But ah, I'll say that Nick's I, I, the only one that picked it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say you won't mind reading D one. It's the only uh, script of the non professionals that I've actually read on this list, uh, and uh, I can tell you that you will not run, mind those first ten pages at all. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but. Uh, Queens of the Stone Age is uh, D2. Uh, that's by Elise Hollander. So Elise is actually managed oh. by John Zazerny, yeah. who was on our last episode. Um, she graduated, graduated UCLA, worked as an assistant at places like Anonymous Content and Universal. Uh, but her career was launched in 2016 when she wrote Blonde Ambition, which was a bio biopic about uh, Madonna. It topped mm -hmm. that year's Blacklist, sold to Universal. She basically just shot up from there. This was an adaptation um, from a GQ article. Uh, she was hired by Sony to write it about um, a true story of a model who uh, moved into weed dealing. Um, and uh, since then, she's uh, worked on the Amy Winehouse biopic. She wrote on Guys and Dolls for TriStar and recently wrote Freaky Friday 2 for Disney. Um, nice. D1 nice. is Knives by Victoria de Capua. Uh, so the log line for that, a sous chef is forced to make a deal with the devil after she discovers the head chef has been stealing from the staff and the mafioso restaurant owner. Uh, Victoria graduated Seattle Central Film and Video Program with honors, attended University of British Columbia School of Creative Writing for screen, TV, and fiction. She also runs screenwriting workshops for scripts that have scored a seven on the blacklist. Um, and uh, I can this pilot is, like I said, I actually did read it, uh, and it's really exceptional. Um, so. Awesome. It's a good right one. Right on. Right on. Here, here's the line that I missed that gives a, why this gives away why what's going on on this first page for D two. Mm -hmm. As David David Bowie's, like it's the first 
line of the fucking thing as david bowie's iconic song fame kicks in which tells us automatically that this is supposed to be the uh, the uh, quintessential um movement right a, a scene of wealth and power and models and fashion week and all that so so you're, it, it 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 does fulfill it tells you what it's supposed to be mm -hmm. on the first page it I does will... tell you that, hey this this looks like every scene you've seen before but there's a reason for that yeah there was mm -hmm. also yeah. i i do I, I want to uh to be fair to elise as well there was a quote on the the page before this so like kind of sort of the technical page one but it wasn't included on the same page and this was the first page that actually had any you know anything that would be shot Right. um so but there was a quote on that and that too so it just kind of all ties in together um yeah but yeah. uh yeah i mean uh, you know it, like you both said um or like you all said i mean also obviously a very professional page um and uh it's I exactly it's good exactly what this one too the, so it was exactly what the guess was which is this was a, a paid job of a professional yeah. that went and did a thing a very specific way yeah so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's it. Um, so guys, yeah. final thoughts, uh, any big surprises on this one or thoughts that you'd like to share for everybody who's watching? Well, you can't judge a script by the first page, but you can't, <laughs> but, but you can yeah. judge, uh, execution. You know, you kind of know what kind of hands you're in and all of these, all four of them. Uh, I didn't see, nothing stood out that told me that these were amateurs. Not, not, nothing stood out. Um, the only, the thing that bumped me about a one the mars that you know the, the, is that that might have been too fast you know like the, the the i love i love learning a whole bunch of stuff but again you can't judge you don't know what they're trying to get to what this scene is about and this is some kind of prologue we just don't know um but i thought they were all very well executed i gotta tell you and that nothing this was harder than i thought it would be because the the people that that you pick the amateurs that you picked um are obviously more than just amateurs they're they're uh they're on their way to to being pros yeah. I, I would say that i mean that's what we do with this like we're because if we just kind of picked random things that came in from people who might have just written their first their first script, no, 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 I don't think it would fun. be a challenge, right? <laughs> yeah. um, right. right. This is great. Better discussion about like what makes what ele right. what's that five percent that elevates something from good right. to great, and like that's kind of what we get to get into doing this, and it makes it more fun. Uh, is like a gamification type thing too. So Very that was cool. a big thing for how Nate how Nate got Jason and I really excited about this. He's like, you know, th th there is really just a five. There is a five percent right. difference. Yeah. If you put what right. actually makes up your ready versus you've got maybe another year, you've got a couple right. of years. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. and, and it really does come down to how easily can you sift in your brain through good, really good, and great ideas. Yeah. And then good, really mm -hmm. good, and great execution. And they all have mm -hmm. to be at this level if you want to be playing in that field, or else it's yeah. just not good enough. So really I, cool. I, I so th really yeah. cool. It's a really great thing you guys are doing, and I hope a lot of writers uh, are, just check this out. There's a there's a lot to uh, to dive into. We could go on for another hour. I mean, you really could. Yeah, we have Easy. to. Like, yeah. we we kind of learned that we have to rein it in a little bit, or these will just go on forever. Um, on one page, which is crazy, but I mean, that just shows you, like, you know, um, how much there is to talk about, how much we care about the craft. I also think it's really cool to have both of you on because, so what I've realized, this is the fifth time we've done this now. As writers, I think like we geek out on it as like fans of of writing and stu students of the writing in, in particular, right? So like when somebody does some uh, something that like just blows our minds and like maybe makes us a little bit jealous and jealous and psychs us up, like we're we're Emotional excited amputee. by those things, right? And yeah, right. not that you aren't excited by those things, but you're offering different perspectives um, just from you know what your careers have been like, and I think that's really valuable because. Um, you know, it's very easy to get into this echo chamber um, of like learning our craft from other writers, but it's useful to get perspectives from people outside of that as well. So thank you oh my both God, yeah. so much for being part of it. Um, yep. I think well, it's, it's really so fun. valuable. I'm sorry I didn't have I don't have I don't own a pair of headphones otherwise I'd I'd wear them. That's so. all right. You we sound did, fantastic. No, you so. no you sound everybody sounded great. 
Um, you know, sir, I want to just reiterate to both of you, thank you so much for doing this with us and, and, and wanting to participate in this, this little experiment. You know, I think it's doing a lot. It, it has the potential of doing a lot of good, I think, and just having people who are earlier in their process, whatever that is, just be like, hey, you should think about this. Like, I learned something today that I don't think I've ever really yeah. thought about. And it was as simple yeah. as, what am I actually learning on this page? I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever broke it down to that simple, like of, of just like, right. am I learning something? And do I like right. what I'm learning? If you take away right. everything else, am I, right. what am I learning? And am I interested in those four, five, six things? And yep, if the answer is no, that tells me something. I thought that so, was great too. I learned, I've learned something every single time we've done one of these, which is awesome. It's so fun. Um, Nick, Nick, did you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, like, I think that uh, it's, it's very interesting what you guys are doing here. And I think that, um, you know, as a new writer, you know, it's so hard trying to break in, um, you know, that like, honestly, like we were talking before about the, you know, the 5% thing um, you know, on the agency side, on the management company side, that really is the way that it's viewed. Like, you know, agents will say to each other, oh, you know, 50% of the material out there, you know, isn't producible. And then, you know, 90% uh. of, of the, of the remainder is good, but not good enough. Mm -hmm. And really, mm -hmm. it's about, you oh. know. You know what it, what it really is is like there is a true five percent of great scripts that end up getting produced, and the way that you get to great is just by time. You Absolutely, know, just, uh, mm -hmm. in, and uh, you know you can. And the thing is that consistently across each and every one of these pages, you can tell that the writers, you know, really put in the effort and really put in the time and developed. Yeah, um, and yeah. it wasn't anything you know shy of that. So yeah, the I'm real too. question is, if there's that, you know, 5% of the cream, then why do so many crappy movies get made? <laughs> uh, I bet you, you're, you're trying to make this go on for another hour, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that is That's a good question. It, it, I yeah, think it's no, because yeah. it, it, it just from, you know, the, the you know, minuscule perspective that, that I've seen, that I've been part of, it, it's like you're, you're not, the people who are making especially on the indie side, it seems like those people aren't looking for the best of the best. They have mm. their own idea that they're like, I'm willing to find whoever is the best person I can get right now to mm. go and do the best version that we can come up with now. Mm. Um, one of my, one, one friend just had that happen. We were like, I, I am embarrassed at how quickly this came together, considering how much more I've put work into everything else I've ever worked on. But because of kind right. of just how this came together, a producer had an idea that he wanted to do in a specific time frame, and you have to go do it. And there's yeah. none of that uh, the tender love and care that need to go in it. So that I am just looking at the, um, the, 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 the big studio template of how fast they want things to really get moving. If they need you to fill that, that, uh, you know, show, you know, the, the uh, when something's going to officially be released on what weekend, I, I don't know how anybody does it. It seems, it seems miraculous. The more I think about it. I, I, it's always I, I, miraculous I, I, when <laughs> something comes together. Yeah. It's, it really, always, it's, it's always a miracle. <laughs> yeah, for top team also, but you know, I've had you know, I've had some projects that I've been developing for for five years, some for ten years, some for you know, for more. Um, you know, and then they finally they finally get made after all that time, whether it's you know development or whether it's you know different uh, castings or you know whatever it may be. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it is a small miracle when you, Dude, when you get <laughs> aftermath is coming out 13 years after i wrote the first script mm. after the first draft <laughs> yep. 13 yep. years well it's, it's like it's dallas, dallas like dallas buyers clubs took so, what 20 which, uh, uh, also yeah. by voltage also yeah. done by voltage pictures by the way um yeah so, um, so something to be said for sticking with a, a something that you really 100%. believe in something that you're you know that hopefully you can always tinker with i too have scripts i've had for 10 years that I'm always, you know, you trying to use the time, you know, instead of just setting it in stone, but when some rereading it, you know, uh, once a year, you know, as I'm trying mm. to get this damn thing going and, and going, oh, you know, I'm always trying to push it further. Uh, so trying to use that time wisely but sticking with something that you believe in is really important. I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I often think uh, tenacity is like just as important as talent in this business <laughs> it's like it's so important because you have to believe um, in it and believe in it forever yeah, yeah. <laughs> be a little yeah. delusional maybe but um on the on that five percent subject just because you brought it back up nick um and because john Turman wrote b1 which was the one with the baby in the bathtub um the first time i ever talked to him was actually after he read an early draft of aftermath back in like 2012 a mutual friend had sent it to him he called me up and he said listen 
this is better than 95% of what's out there. That's not a compliment. Like, <laughs> if you want to like succeed, you need to like be better than 99% of mm -hmm. what's out there. And mm -hmm. it was like, that was a really life changing comment for me to receive. Like, it was like, okay, you're on the right track, mm -hmm. but like, you're not there yet. And so I had to, I'd already been at this for like seven or eight years. I had gotten my first manager and everything. Right. And like, I had to kind of like say, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to like brush him off? Or am I going to like say, okay, you know what, what do I need to do to, to be better than 99% of writers? Right. And so I don't know if I'm there yet, but like, that's what I've been chasing ever since then. And that was a really important comment for me to receive at that time. I think yeah. that's the hard thing. Again, that night, that 5%, I think most writers and mo most creatives in general aren't willing to internalize not being good enough now. Nobody yeah. wants to believe they're yeah. not good enough now. I put in the time. I put it totally. a, 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 and the entitled ego of the creative heart is very strong. And it's like, no, I put in my time. It's it's time to cash in. And it, it has been one of the hardest things for, for just me to, to be like, no, no. A, 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 a heart that is willing to always learn and wants to be better and wants to listen to anyone who is kind or generous enough to want to help you, you jerk, you do it, you know, like, so, <laughs> right. you know, and, but I think that's probably the biggest thing that I, I've seen stand in the way for people, which is just, they don't, yeah. they're not, they're not looking at it from a perspective of let me be better genuinely. Yeah. yeah. Right on. A genuine cool. love of the craft goes a long way. Yeah. Love of the game. Amen. Absolutely. You, well, you guys, guys clearly love it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think we'd be sticking with <laughs> this long and, uh, if we didn't. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that love uh, I, I've found t tends to to be with anybody who sticks with whatever their, their various craft is in this world, because uh, it's a really mm. challenging business. Um, yep. Guys, thank you so much for being part of this. Seriously. Uh, it's real yeah, thank you guys a lot. Uh, this was great. I can't wait for people to see this. I think uh, just the perspectives that you share are going to be really useful to all the writers who are watching this. Um, so thank you for that. Um, to everybody watching, uh, you know, leave the comments. Thank these guys for being part of it. Uh, go watch Trapo. Uh, the second season just came out on Amazon. It's like number four right now, I think, which is great. Yeah, pretty, um, pretty darn good. Yeah, super cool. Um, and if you'd like to see more episodes with guests of this caliber, just keep doing what you're doing. Share, like, comment, subscribe. All that stuff makes more people see it. And that includes people uh, who are in the industry who might uh, come on as future guests. So uh, if you're a pro or amateur screenwriter and you'd like to submit a page for a future episode, you can check out the link in the description below. Uh, we're always open to more submissions. If you're an industry professional who's read a ton of scripts and you'd like to be part of a future one of these, follow that same link, get in touch. Thanks very much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in the next one.